Our sun looks nothing like this. It looks more like this. If you've always thought our sun was a bright yellow ball of fire, you were wrong. For starters, it's not yellow, it's green. Uh, sort of. Scientists determine the temperature of a star by the color spectrum it emits. Each color has its own wavelength, and astronomers measure those wavelengths to tell how hot a star is. Cooler stars appear red, the hottest of the stars look blue. Our sun emits most of its energy at a wavelength that's close to green. But because it also emits other wavelengths, all these colors mix together and your eyes see this vibrant mixture as white. That is, if you look at the sun from the International Space Station. From here on Earth, the sun looks yellow because our atmosphere is really good at scattering blue light. And with all that blue wavelength gone, all the other colors combine into yellow. If our star was actually yellow, it would be about 800 degrees Celsius cooler, our solar system's habitable zone would shrink, and Earth would become a frozen, lifeless rock. But that's not the only thing you were wrong about. The sun is hot, but it's not on fire. Burning is a chemical reaction of oxygen with fuel. Like most stars out there, our sun is a ball of gas, mostly made up of hydrogen and helium. It doesn't have much oxygen in it. Instead, it works more like a gigantic nuclear reactor, constantly fusing hydrogen atoms to create helium inside its core. This process releases enormous amounts of energy, and that's why the sun is so scorching hot. Speaking of setting things on fire, let me tell you about explosions in space. Yeah, these aren't real. A spaceship can't go down in a violent blast because there's no air out there in space. No air means no oxygen, and no oxygen, well, as you already know, means no fire. Sorry, Star Wars fans. It may seem that there are too many stars in the night sky for you to count, but actually, you can. Although scientists at Harvard have already done it for you. According to the Yale Bright Star Catalog, there are 9,110 stars that you can see from Earth with the naked eye. Try to count them all for yourself. Movies make it look like you need to be an extremely skilled pilot to navigate the asteroid belt, but that's not true. The asteroid belt isn't some thick obstacle course of death. It does have trillions of space rocks that range in size from space dust to a quarter the size of the moon. About 100,000 of these asteroids are over one kilometer wide, but they're very spread out. The asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter is 225 million kilometers across. That's one and a half times the distance between Earth and the Sun. And this spreads the space rocks millions of kilometers apart. It's almost impossible for a spacecraft to collide with one. If you were thrown out of the airlock into the vastness of space, you wouldn't turn into a popsicle right away. That's because, to freeze, there has to be a heat transfer from space to your body. But heat, or cold, doesn't travel very fast in the vacuum of space. Your body would freeze, but it would take hours to happen. And by then, you'd be long dead from something else. And no, you wouldn't explode in space either. You would inflate, though. That's because nitrogen in your bloodstream would gather into bubbles and puff you up to double your size. But that's not what's going to kill you. It's the lack of oxygen. After 15 seconds in space, your brain wouldn't get enough oxygen through your blood. And you'd lose consciousness. After two minutes in space, your other organs would start to shut down one by one. Game over. Space seems incredibly cold, but it's not. In reality, space doesn't have a temperature at all. 
temperature is defined by the speed at which particles move and the amount of energy they have. In the true vacuum of space, there are no particles to move around. That's why the vacuum is temperatureless. Of course, outer space isn't a perfect vacuum. It still has particles and radiation to produce heat. Some areas of space are actually really hot, like the space around stars. But the further away you get from stars, the more spread out the particles are, making those areas of space pretty chilly. Some dense gas clouds can get as cold as minus 263 degrees Celsius. Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, but surprisingly, it's not the hottest. It is extreme, though. During the day, the surface temperature reaches 430 degrees. And at night, it drops to minus 180. Oof! But the most hellish planet in the solar system is Venus. You see, Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere to retain all that heat from the Sun. The Venusian atmosphere, on the other hand, is very thick and it creates a greenhouse effect. It's like global warming on steroids. And it makes Venus a hot hell with a surface temperature of about 475 degrees. Our entire solar system isn't just sitting in one spot in our galaxy. It's hurtling through space at 220 kilometers per second. That's seven times faster than the speed that Earth revolves around the Sun. Our solar system takes 230 million years to make one orbit around the Milky Way. Yeah, the last time we were in the same location we are now, Earth had one supercontinent and the dinosaurs were just starting to roam around. Planets do not orbit around the Sun. All the things in our solar system are in balance and even though the Sun is the most massive object in our planetary neighborhood, other planets are participating in this gravitational tug-of-war. Instead of orbiting the Sun, planets and moons orbit around a central point between them and our star. This point is called the barycenter. For Earth, this barycenter is so close to the Sun's core that there's not much of a difference, but for Jupiter, this point is about 55,000 kilometers away from the center of the Sun. So the gas giant and the Sun are orbiting each other. Earth appears round from space, but it's actually an irregularly shaped ellipsoid. It bulges at the equator thanks to the centrifugal force caused by our planet's spin. As a result, Earth is about 43 kilometers wider at the equator than it is at the poles. This makes gravity at the bulge slightly weaker, making it easier to launch spaceships from the equatorial regions than from the poles. In space, no one can hear you scream. And that's only true to a point. Sound needs a medium to travel through, and in space, Molecules are very far apart, so the sound fades away before it can get very far. All the cosmic catastrophes, supernovas, and colliding black holes go quiet before you can hear them. But some places in space have a lot of particles for sound to travel through. Like the hot gas cloud around the black hole at the center of the Perseus galaxy cluster. It has so much gas that you can actually hear the black hole. This is what it sounds like. If the Earth had an edge, I hope it would look like this. The edge of a flat Earth. I know, I know, we've talked about it before, but there's something mesmerizing about it. A flat Earth solar eclipse? Diagonally growing trees? The Great Wall of Ice, guarded by NASA, of course. <laughs> the Flat Earthers sure have a great imagination, but what if they were right? How would the Earth hold up in space? Would it revolve around the Sun or 
would the sun rotate around it? And why would you never walk to the Earth's edge? This is what if, and here's what would happen if the Earth was flat. In case you missed the news on the Flat Earth Channel, here's a quick recap. For thousands of years, the general public thought that the Earth was flat and everything revolved around it. Then, Nikolaus Copernicus came around with his spanking new theory. The theory said that the Earth wasn't flat and definitely not the center of anything. His observations led him to believe that our planet is orbiting the sun. But here we are, 500 years later, and some people around the globe are convinced that the Earth is flat. Well, how would this even work? Do you know why the planets form in a spherical shape? One word, gravity. Gravity is what's pulling matter together equally from every side. And as a result, matter forms into a sphere. Of course, this wouldn't be the case for a flat Earth. Anti-round Earthers think that there's no such thing as gravity. We only feel like there is because some mysterious force is accelerating the pancake-shaped Earth upwards. I don't need to tell you that you can't increase the speed forever. At some point, you'd be going too fast. Ugh, does anybody feel like a burnt pancake? No? If you want some real science, then yes, there would be gravity on a flat Earth. And it would be weird. The center of gravity on a flat Earth would be right here in the middle. Everything on Earth and around would be pulled to this point. And the further you got away from the center, the stronger this pull would be. At some point, it would begin to pull you downward, so you would have to start climbing. This would be the reason why you couldn't walk to the edge of a flat Earth. Gravity would be so strong around there that it would be impossible for you to make it. You might never see the gorgeous 45-meter-tall wall of ice called Antarctica, guard railing the Earth's edge. And you'd never learn what's on the flip side. But at least you wouldn't fall off of it. There would be other side effects of this funny gravity. Objects closer to the edge of the Earth would fall sideways instead of down. Gravity would also make trees grow diagonally on most of the pancake-like Earth, because they'd be reaching against the pull of gravity. All the rain, snow, and hail would fall toward the Arctic at the center of the Earth. The precipitation would converge and start to build up. The oceans would get sucked to the center of the disk too, and form one big ocean in the middle. A big concern would be the air pressure on a flat Earth. Gravity would draw too much air toward the Earth's center, leaving the areas around the edge with no air pressure at all. That would be bad because people living in a flat Earth Australia wouldn't have enough oxygen to breathe. And if you lived closer to the middle, where the Arctic would be, you'd be crushed by the weight of the atmosphere. But not for long. A flat Earth wouldn't have a geomagnetic field around it. This field is generated by the movements of the Earth's core and, well, a flat Earth just wouldn't have one. Nothing would be holding our atmosphere in place, and eventually, it would spill into space. We'd be exposed to solar radiation that would cause cancer and damage our DNA. And we'd have no breathable air anywhere on the planet. So, I hope you're able to find a life support system lying around. Now, let's get to those questions we've all been waiting for. What would orbit what in this arrangement? Would there be a day and night cycle? Or time zones? Every flat earther knows that the sun goes in circles around a pancake-shaped earth, and so does the moon. They're both around 50 kilometers in diameter and 
act like huge spotlights. But let's bring good old science to the equation. If the sun worked as a spotlight, you'd see it from everywhere on Earth. Even if it didn't shine directly on you, it would look like those alien abduction scenes. Hmm, I wonder where they got that idea from. In this system, there would be no day and night cycle. That would be pretty strange. How am I supposed to get my beauty sleep? Okay, I know how to fix this. Yeah, that's better. For a flat Earth to have days alternating with nights, the sun would have to orbit the planet this way. When the sun was up, the entire planet of Earth would experience daylight. And when the sun went down, the Earth would fall into nighttime. There would be no time zones and no seasons either, but you could still mess up your schedule by staying up late and watching what if videos. You'd be lucky if the sun was so much smaller than the Earth. Sort of. Think of this. If the sun retained its gigantic form as it was orbiting a flat Earth, it would burn down the entire planet. That's because of how close it would get to us. On the other hand, if the sun were much smaller than it really is, we'd freeze to death. That's because the flat Earth would have nearly two and a half times the surface area of our round Earth. We'd be getting only one third of a regular sized sun's energy. That's not enough for life on a flat Earth to exist. And we haven't even talked about this yet. The lunar eclipse. Flat Earth disciples believe in some kind of anti-moon that's responsible for these. On our round Earth, lunar eclipses happen when the Earth lines up between the Sun and the Moon. If that was the case for a flat Earth, this is how those eclipses might look. And even that would require some very special alignment. So, if the flat Earth conspiracy turned out to be true, that our globe was indeed photoshopped and GPS devices were rigged for some financial gain? Well, that would open up a conversation to other conspiracy theories. Unfortunately, many people, including the Flat Earthers, are living in a state of cognitive dissonance. That's when their thoughts and beliefs aren't quite consistent and don't always represent reality. I mean, we are constantly exposed to pseudo-evidence that can support any theory at all, even if it falls flat with a bit of logical thinking. If Copernicus had spent 10 hours on YouTube watching Flat Earth conspiracy videos, even he might have admitted he was wrong. When you think of ringed planets, well, you probably assume there's only one of them in our solar system, Saturn. But... What if I told you that there are three other planets similar to Saturn? Yeah, it's true. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune all have their own sets of rings. Most people don't know about them because they're much thinner and pretty much invisible from Earth. We only learned about them when Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 flew past them in the 1970s and 80s. Some scientists even think that Earth had rings at some point in its existence. Four and a half billion years ago, when a planet the size of Mars smashed into our young rock, it ejected so much debris that it likely, briefly, formed a small ring around Earth. Despite their unimaginably massive gravitational pull, black holes don't go around sucking in everything in their way. It just doesn't work like that. Black holes are more like sinkholes. If you were to get too close to one, you'd get spaghettified and lost to the blackness of this monstrosity. But if you're far enough away from it, you'd be safe. Even if our sun was replaced in the middle of our solar system by a black hole with similar mass, all the planets would just orbit like nothing happened. Things would get pretty dark, though. Now, speaking of darkness, the moon doesn't have a dark side. Our planetary partner gets hit by the sunlight all around. 
The reason why you don't see the other side of the moon is because it's always facing away from us. Yeah, our moon rotates on its axis at the same rate it orbits Earth, making it what's called tidally locked to our planet. If a large asteroid is on a deadly collision course with Earth, the best thing to do is to nuke it. Oh, sorry, wait, I've actually got that wrong. Do not nuke asteroids that are about to collide with us. The reason why? Well, because the nuclear explosion will shatter the asteroid into millions of smaller pieces. Yeah, the pieces that would still be headed for impact with us. Instead of dealing with just one giant asteroid, we'd have to deal with multiple impacts. And it would make our evacuation really difficult, or straight up impossible. Now, you still can use a nuke to prevent an asteroid collision, but you don't even have to strike the space rock. We just set off a nuke near the asteroid. Emphasis on near. Then, the force from the blast would nudge it off course. And that would keep our planet safe. Hopefully. Standing on Earth at night, you can see thousands of stars, but the view from the moon is actually quite boring. Yeah, astronauts who traveled to the moon reported that stars aren't easily visible from there. Because our moon is super reflective, it really cranks up the brightness, making it harder to see out to the stars. It's kind of like stargazing in a city with a lot of light pollution. Not fun. You'd need to travel further into space to get some better views. Traveling in space won't make you taller. Though it's true that astronauts can grow up to five centimeters in space, well, that's because the Earth's gravity doesn't weigh them down and the vertebrae in their spines are able to expand a bit. But this effect is only temporary. As soon as you return to Earth, you get back to your regular height. Yeah, thanks, gravity. And space travel doesn't make you age slower, either. Not really. Albert Einstein theorized that time would pass slower for someone traveling at high speeds versus for someone stationary. This is called time dilation. And while it's true, you'd have to travel incredibly fast to achieve this de-aging effect. Like, almost speed of light fast. Yeah, with our current space traveling technology, the difference in time is so minimal that it's not even worth calculating. If you thought crying in space was impossible, well, first, why? And second, you're wrong. It's just different. Without gravity to pull your tears down, they don't trickle down your face like they do here on Earth. The tears just stick to your eyes and form a sort of watery blob. They might even cover your eyes if you cry a lot. So while you can totally cry in space, it's probably best that you don't. Eh, not great for visibility. Hey, Martian dust storms are a real headache. The dust particles are so fine that they can get anywhere. And these dust storms can last for months, but they can't physically damage any equipment that we leave on the red planet. The thing is, is that the Martian atmosphere is super thin, just about 1% of the atmosphere we have on Earth. So even when these dust particles zoom around at about 100 kilometers per hour, they can't pack a big punch without the help of air. But what they can do is cover our solar panels and put our rovers into power-saving hibernation. Oh, and I wouldn't inhale this dust either. Who knows what this fine powder could do to your lungs long term? Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Up above the world so high, this song is a big fat lie. Yeah, despite the famous children's song, stars don't twinkle. The flickering is just an illusion. Their light is actually very steady. Stars appear to twinkle, due to the gas molecules that make up our atmosphere. They deflect some of the light from stars, making them appear as if they're shimmering. Asteroid belts are typically depicted as minefields of floating rocks, 
spaceships have to weave in and out of the asteroids in a life or death situation, but in reality, our asteroid belts are nothing like what you see in the movies. Asteroids aren't that close together. In fact, they're extremely far apart. For example, in the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars, each of the asteroids is several million kilometers away from their nearest neighbor. And the chances of a collision are about one in one billion. So while Han, Chewie, and Leia had you on the edge of your seat in The Empire Strikes Back, asteroid fields like that are far from reality. The Great Wall of China is known to be the only man-made object that's visible from space. But this is entirely false. Yeah, sure, maybe you could see it with a camera and a zoom lens, but it's almost invisible to the naked eye. At 5 to 10 meters wide, the wall is way too thin to be seen from space. However, you can still see plenty of other man-made objects from space. Things like dams, bridges, and pyramids. And at night, you can see a light show from the world's big cities. Did you know that there's a mysterious area in space where astronauts are unable to communicate with home base? They're exposed to extreme levels of radiation and their spaceships start to malfunction. It's being dubbed the Bermuda Triangle of Space. This area has perplexed scientists for decades, but astronomers may have finally solved this outer space anomaly. What exactly is the Bermuda Triangle of Space anyway? Well, its official name is the South Atlantic Anomaly, or SAA for short. It's hovering above the South Atlantic, stretching from Chile to Zimbabwe, and this area has a considerably weaker magnetic field when compared to the rest of the Van Allen Radiation Belt. The Van Allen Radiation Belt is a pair of cosmic donuts surrounding Earth. This is a unique location where the radiation belt comes closest to the Earth's surface. These belts trap particles that shoot from the sun, which protects the Earth from harmful radiation. The solar radiation within the South Atlantic anomaly isn't held back to the same degree, though. But why? Well, to explain that, first, let's dive into what happens if you wander into this terrifying part of our solar system. The SAA is known for causing electronic malfunctions in spaceships and extreme radiation exposure for astronauts. It can completely destroy spacecraft. In 2016, the Japanese satellite Hitomi came crashing down to Earth after satellite operators began getting mixed signals from the ship. It was reporting inaccurate data about how it was performing up in space, making people down on Earth think that everything was fine, but this was happening as it traveled through the SAA, so operators weren't aware that there was a problem and couldn't take steps to correct it. The Hubble telescope, luckily, has managed to avoid any issues while traveling through the SAA. That's despite spending a whopping 15% of its time in the space anomaly. To protect the telescope, satellite operators power it down. If they didn't, the SAA could corrupt any precious data that's being collected and potentially crash. But how do astronauts deal with these heavy levels of radiation? Well, their radiation levels are constantly being monitored, so if they do end up in the anomaly, they have what's known as a water wall. Certain rooms on ships are filled with these massive bags of water, and if you stand behind them, they'll protect you from radiation. Water is the best thing to shield you from this harmful energy because of its high hydrogen content. Now, if they didn't have this water wall, they could get severe radiation poisoning or even cancer. So we know the radiation levels are much higher and more dangerous in this specific part of space, but why is it happening in the first place? Well, despite what pictures might show you, Earth isn't completely round. It bulges around the center, like me. And because of this, the Earth's physical center and its magnetic center are slightly off by about 500 kilometers. This offset means things like cosmic rays can get closer to the Earth's surface near the bulging area. Luckily, the Earth's magnetic bubble can still keep all those dangerous rays from getting to us, but that's not the case for people in space above the South Atlantic. Because of this, stronger radiation levels can reach this point up in space, and what's even more concerning? 
due to the fact that the magnetic poles here on Earth are constantly changing, the South Atlantic anomaly keeps growing. It's also gotten weaker by 15%, meaning the radiation has gotten stronger in the area. So NASA has been carefully monitoring the SAA since 2019. They've noticed that the anomaly is moving west. And what's even weirder, the anomaly is also splitting in two. If this continues, it could make things even more complicated regarding space travel and data collection. But luckily, for it to change significantly would take millions, if not billions, of years. So this Bermuda Triangle of space isn't as mysterious as it sounds, and astronomers are getting better at handling it with every new ship launch and every piece of data recorded. No, that's not Photoshop. That's an actual video from the International Space Station of the Moon looking a bit squished. Wow. So what happened here? Is the cover-up behind a flat moon an elaborate government conspiracy? How would this affect the oceans? What would happen to our climate? And could the moon fly out into space? This is What If, and here's what would happen if the moon was flat. In 2010, an astronaut on the International Space Station observed a bizarre phenomenon. When he glanced out the window, he saw the moon looked flattened when it appeared in the thickest part of the Earth's atmosphere. And those of you in the Flat Earth Society, don't at me, it's not flat. High above the planet, the air bends light to give the moon this squished look in these very specific conditions. But if the moon were flat, it would explain why we never see the mysterious dark side. And if this was our reality, how would this affect gravity on Earth? Okay, there are no illusions this time. The moon is flat. So, how would that happen? Well, a celestial body would need to spin incredibly fast to become a flat disk. So fast that it would rip into tiny pieces before it would ever have a chance to form. For our purposes, let's say the moon survived this process and formed like a plate. Would this flat moon have the same mass as what we see right now? Well, as a flat disk, the moon could have 25% of the thickness, but the width might remain the same. With so much less mass floating above the Earth, the change in ocean tides could be the first noticeable effect. The moon's gravitational pull generates these tides. Our moon pulls the water on the side of the Earth that's closest to it, but this flat moon would have less mass and less gravitational effect on our planet. And the altered tides would affect more than just surfers. Ocean tides stir up material below the water's surface, allowing coastal ecosystems to thrive. Without the usual strong waves, animal life in the oceans, like crabs, mussels, and snails, could die off in mass numbers. This chain reaction could decimate life worldwide. And that's not all a flat moon would ruin. Remember, the tides also push water back and forth around the planet. When warm waters travel from one area to another, these tidal forces change weather patterns globally. Without the strong tides, we could experience extreme temperature changes. But even with all these devastating changes, the climate still wouldn't change as fast as the days. The moon's mass influences our planet's rotation, giving us a 24-hour day. But with a flat moon, the day could be only 15 hours long. But I think most of us could live with a five-hour workday. And while we'd get more sunlight, the nights would be even darker. You see, the moon reflects the sunlight to give off that bright glow we all know and love. A smaller moon would reflect less light, 
making it much dimmer. That would make it harder for nocturnal animals that rely on the moon for navigation and hunting. But maybe none of that would matter since it could potentially crash right into us. Wait, what? Yeah, the Earth and the moon are locked together in an eternal dance. The motion created by one affects the other. I know, this sounds hippy-dippy, but trust me, we're talking science here. The same tidal forces that move the oceans also affect the moon's orbit. The tidal bulges in the ocean rotate faster than the moon orbits the Earth, and this rotation takes energy away from the Earth and transfers that into the moon's orbit. This is called tidal friction and causes the moon to drift away from us at the rate of 3.82 centimeters every year. A flat moon with less mass would orbit closer to our planet. So maybe it wouldn't slam into Earth, but our view of celestial phenomena wouldn't be the same. Right now, the sun and moon are positioned just perfectly that when aligned, we get a spectacular image of a total eclipse on Earth. The moon covers the sun entirely in this breathtaking event. A squished moon wouldn't be able to block out the sun entirely during an eclipse, and we would see the top and bottom of the sun peeking out. A flat moon could destroy the balance of life on Earth and threatens every ecosystem and living organism, including humans. Billions of years ago, another planet smashed into Earth. An event of this epicness could have created our moon. It also could have brought alien life to our planet. What evidence of this planet still exists on Earth today? Could there be life deep inside the Earth's surface? And could that life be an advanced civilization of humanoid aliens? This is What If, and here's what would happen if aliens are living inside the Earth. Four and a half billion years ago, Theia, a protoplanet the size of Mars, struck our young Earth. This collision scattered pieces of both planets into space. And many scientists argue that these pieces eventually coalesced into our moon. But what happened to the rest of Theia is still a mystery. The existence of blobs of material inside Earth's mantle, known as low shear velocity provinces could be evidence that parts of Theia fused with Earth. These chunks are up to 1,000 kilometers in height and several times that in width. They sit below Africa and the Pacific Ocean, straddling Earth's core like a pair of headphones. But other theories, some dating back centuries, suggest a completely different explanation of what exists under the surface. A lush, tropical paradise for aliens. The Earth consists of four layers, the crust, the mantle, and the outer and inner core. But there hasn't been any successful exploration below the crust, so there's much we don't know about the realities below the surface. This has led to spectacular speculation, like the hollow Earth theory. According to this theory, our planet could be a series of nested spheres centered around a central core. In between these shells, atmospheres could exist that are capable of supporting life. In the 17th century, Edmund Halley, the scientist who discovered Halley's Comet, backed this theory. Many others have added to it, suggesting a small sun could be hanging in the center of the Earth, and plants, animals, and humans could be living there. And not just humans, but a race of superhumans. Immortals who possess sophisticated technology to build hundreds of subterranean cities. But if there were aliens inside the Earth, what would the conditions for life be? 
Could the inside of our planet be a luscious paradise? Or a hot, hellish dump? If you were to visit one of the low shear velocity provinces, you'd have to go 2,900 kilometers below the surface. Here, you'd be surrounded by magma or liquid rock with temperatures as high as 3,700 degrees Celsius. And the weight of the crust and mantle above you would increase the pressure to over 237,000 times the atmospheric pressure, you know, on the surface of the Earth. Whatever life you find here would need to exist in these extreme conditions. And these life forms would need to evolve to extract oxygen directly from the magma, or live without it. They'd need to survive without any sunlight. Radiation would be the primary energy source. And lucky for them, the radioactive decay of uranium, thorium, and potassium in the Earth's crust and mantle already account for the primary source of heat in the Earth's interior. There could be all kinds of undiscovered creatures down there, but until you could withstand the pressure and heat to find out, we'll never know. And as for the hollow Earth, well, it's nice to imagine a paradise world underneath our feet instead of layers upon layers of hot molten rock. Just north of the Martian equator lies a 45-kilometer-wide impact crater that scientists believe may have been the site of an ancient lake. Here at Jezero Crater, scientists theorize that its frozen soil may contain the most significant discovery of humankind, life. On February 18th, 2021, NASA's Perseverance rover started searching this crater to find out if we're truly alone. What is the likelihood of life on Mars? What would these Martians look like? And how will we send samples back to Earth? This is What If, and here's what would happen if we discovered life on Mars. As Scientific American puts it, it would take a near miracle for Mars to be sterile. Astrobiologist Chris McKay at NASA believes that Earth and Mars have been sharing materials for billions of years. Kind of like using your roommate's spice rack. What, I thought you said it was communal. Comets or large meteorites that have hit Earth may have also sent debris onto Mars. A tiny fraction of this debris on Mars could have carried the same microbes that kick-started life as we know it on Earth. But what would this alien life look like? Many scientists agree that whatever life on Mars we might find would need to be incredibly robust. With the combination of radiation and freezing temperatures on Mars, could any life form survive such a harsh environment? As far-fetched as it sounds, microbiologists have discovered many organisms that thrive in extreme environments. The tardigrade, or water bear, is a highly resistant extremophile. It can withstand heat, cold, pressure, radiation, and even a complete lack of oxygen. There are also certain types of bacteria on Earth that rapidly produce spores when faced with hazardous conditions. The bacteria can then hibernate during an extended period of drought and withstand intense ionizing radiation. A team of 1,000 geologists, chemists, physicists, and biologists worldwide have drilled 4.8 kilometers into the Earth and discovered robust life forms. Mars has a similar geological past to Earth, so looking underground could be a great place to start. 
By drilling into the Jezero crater, we could encounter spores associated with a relatively recent geological era. And on future missions to Mars, we may dig deeper and uncover fully vegetative microbes. To find rock samples that might support life, NASA's Perseverance rover uses an array of lasers called a supercam. It can study the surface of Mars at a distance. One of the lasers will heat a rock sample and vaporize it. This creates a plasma that can be analyzed to understand its elemental composition. Another laser will reveal which compounds are in the dirt. If the supercam detects organic molecules or elevated concentrations of elements like nitrogen or phosphorus, the rover will head over to take a closer look. It will then scan the soil in greater detail to detect any organic material hiding in the dirt. NASA's team on Earth has only one shot at picking the right spot to gather these samples. With limited space on board the rover, only a few dozen samples can be collected. So, no pressure and fingers crossed. If all goes well, NASA plans to bring back samples known for preserving biosignatures on Earth. Biosignatures are faint molecular traces left behind by microbes billions of years ago. Once the samples are collected, NASA and the European Space Agency plan two missions to get them back to Earth. This involves blasting tubes of rock and soil samples into orbit to be collected by another spacecraft and then returned to Earth. Whoa, this looks kind of fun. If Perseverance's mission is successful, the discovery of life on Mars would be as groundbreaking as the discovery of DNA. In 1543, Copernicus boldly shook the status quo with his theory that the planets orbited the sun. His discoveries completely changed our worldview, no longer putting Earth at the center of the universe. Discovering life beyond Earth could be just as powerful. But not finding any life could raise more questions. Is the Earth truly special? Are we alone out here? Even if we don't discover life, these Martian rock samples will allow chemists to study the geochemistry, mineralogy, and foundational bedrock materials of Mars in detail. This could provide us with essential insights into the climate history of Mars and help us better understand Earth's climate as well. In 1976, two Viking landers became the first spacecrafts from Earth to touch down on Mars. They too probed for life in the Martian soil, and the results are still debated to this day. One experiment indicated that the Martian soil tested positive for metabolism. On Earth, this would almost certainly suggest the presence of life. But another related experiment found no trace of organic material whatsoever. While most scientists have not reconciled the conflicting results, the consensus is that there's no conclusive evidence of life on Mars. But several researchers disagree. Recent discoveries of terrestrial microorganisms surviving outside of the ISS indicate that life may be resilient enough for Mars. And methane in the Martian atmosphere could be a sign of microbial methanogens a type of microorganism that produces a significant amount of methane. Stinky aliens. Mind you, it's possible that life on Mars didn't have the right conditions to start at all. Or maybe it died off from an extinction event similar to the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. Or it's even possible that we might end up finding life that was accidentally brought to Mars by one of our many rovers. Let's hope this Perseverance mission doesn't turn into a $2.7 billion facepalm. If Mars is your bag, well, have you ever thought about setting up shop there? With recent developments in rocketry, colonizing Mars might be possible in our lifetime. <laughs> you better strap in because that's a story 
for another What If. Our sun looks nothing like this. It looks more like this. If you've always thought 